Let's turn, uh, let's, let's go back to uh, Galatians chapter number five. And uh, some of you are noticing. And, uh, and I'm noticing because you're noticing that something is happening to the uh, sunflower plants. And uh, whereas a few days ago there were no blooms, uh, flowers, there sure are, there sure are now, and more, more to come. Um, all that water, oh, I'll tell you what, folks, I, I sent out a video of, did you get that, the video of the, I mean, it was a lake out here in the parking lot, I mean, it was, it was. It was, uh, I mean, it was amazing. And all that water uh, made a difference in those sunflowers. You know what? All this water, if you let it in, it'll make a difference in your life. And uh, so the water and uh, all the food, uh, it's making a difference. Um, now, um, those first seeds had a very hard outer shell, those first sunflower seeds. I mean, they're like rock hard. But there was life inside that little seed. In order for that life to come out, the hard outer shell, it literally had to, um, it had to come off. It had to come off. And once that, that outer shell of that sunflower seed um, got out of the way of the life that was on the inside of that seed, well, you can see, you can see the rest of the story. <laughs> and um, so that's God's work. That is God's work. It's uh, the work of sanctification, and it's a work that only God can do. He does it His way. He does it in His time, and He does it to every child of His. You know, once, uh, once Jesus is uh, accepted, that puts the life within. And there's this shell around the life that is now within. <laughs> and uh, something has to happen to that outer shell so that the life will come forth, be seen, be fruitful, productive, and that's what God does. And uh, yes, trials uh, are very much part of getting rid of that outer shell so the life within can come out. Um, not only has the life come out, but uh, there's going to be thousands of uh, seeds, thousands of pieces of fruit. Can I say that about a sunflower uh, bloom or blossom? There are thousands. So from one is coming thousands. And uh, so what a visual, what a visual illustration for um, fruit bearing. And so uh, uh, let's uh, let, let me get myself to Galatians here, chapter number five, and then I'll be right where I need to be, along with the rest of you. Galatians, chapter number five, and then uh, we'll drop down to the fruit of the spirit, and I think we are going to pick it up with goodness, goodness. So another uh, fruit on the end of the branch. And this has everything to do with holiness, godliness, uh, purity, uh, 
goodness. And um, so let's quick review. When these pieces of fruit are displayed on the end of the branch, what in fact, uh, maybe I should say, who in fact is being displayed? It's, it's God. It's God. Yes, Jesus. And uh, have you noticed, um, I've been noticing, um, th this is the fruit that God wills every child of his display. But have you noticed how easy it is to hit the override button? And, um, I mean, <laughs> you can get into a car with all the right fruit on display, and not very long after you enter into traffic, uh, something else starts to go on display. Um, <laughs> you can hit the override button so easily and uh, put, uh, well, the f other fruit, the fruit of the flesh. That can go on display uh, just in, in, in a heartbeat, in a nanosecond. Um, and, oh, I mean, I mean, so I just, I just cite the example of the traffic. Um, yeah, I didn't, want, I, I didn't want to use that harsh of a term, but, but you're right. <laughs> and and uh, probably, um, maybe I'm trying to go a little easier on myself, Brother Rick. Uh, but, uh, you know... Um, Wow. Guy was washing his windshield of his car, driving down the highway, speaking of road rage. Um, and you know how you make the uh, windshield washer fluid come out onto your windshield and then you use your wipers to clean it off. But his overshot some of his overshot his vehicle and landed on the vehicle behind him <laughs> last week up in the Portland, Oregon area. Uh, the driver behind was so enraged that the windshield fluid got onto his vehicle that he, long story short, pulled up alongside the driver and, and shot him to death. And uh, he had a friend with him and his three children were in the vehicle. And his friend and three children are all alive. But uh, the uh, children's daddy has gone out into eternity. You see, I mean, see, uh, it's serious. And that, you know, it's serious. And that's why I tell it. It, it's that's how serious it is see that that's another kind of fruit that was being put on display and and that and that fruit is um, is uh, found in the preceding verses I believe beginning in verse 19 and 20 and and I think it goes right on into verse number 20 yeah 21 uh, you see, wrath, see wrath there? R wrath is anger released. It, that, uh, that it's anger that, that goes into action. I mean, see, that's, it's so serious, it is. And, uh, and you know, so uh, when, See, it's, it's really a red flag. It is. It, it's a red flag. It, it's a warning. It's like, okay, um, there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. If, if that kind of fruit, if that kind of fruit 
is on the end of my branch. That says to me, uh, we, we need to check our connection here. We need to, yeah, you know, and because, um, see, all, all of that, you know, um, look, a couple of years ago, a uh, very dear pastor friend, uh, I was out fixing, you know, a uh, broken sprinkler head, something, and I heard a man call me from the fence line. Well, I walked over, couldn't rec recognize him. It had been so many years. It's been, I don't know how many years since uh, I had seen this brother. And um, we visited. He was over here because he saw a vehicle for sale. He And the vehicle was here in this area, somewhere in the neighborhood. And he was over here to check this used vehicle out. And, uh, and, uh, and I kid you not, one month later, one month later, uh, the uh, evening news uh, reported that a pastor had, uh, had shot, had murdered his next door neighbor and her friend. And, uh, and then last, last week I saw in the newspaper uh, that this pastor had been sentenced and, uh, and he's, he's been given uh, life without uh, parole. Uh, see, this is a pastor, this is a, this is a, a man that has... Uh, you know, I mean, been serving the Lord for decades. I mean, so, you know, um, serious. It's serious, you know. It's serious. It really is. So it's, it's nothing to, uh, you know, uh, take lightly. Um, because you, you get the wrong fruit. If there's a disconnect. You get the wrong fruit. Um, you know, then, uh, you know, we talked about David, did we not? David, Sunday night. God's king, king on earth. He was guilty of murder. He was guilty of murder. David. I mean, see, so, um, and just, just a moment of rage. Just, just a, a, just a moment. In just a moment, in a moment, life can change. Life can, and lives and families and can be changed in, in just a moment. It, so, I say all that. I think, and I hope that it makes it the emphasis of how important it is that. The child of God is connected to the vine because uh, if there's a disconnect, you know, this this stuff really happens, folks. It really does happen, and uh, so wow, it's serious. It is um, goodness, goodness. Well, what what can we um, understand from God's word then? about the uh, about uh, this fruit about uh, you know and remember each piece of the fruit is representative of God of Jesus so you look in Psalm 25 and uh, and uh, Psalm uh, chapter 25 and then uh, you know uh, and you know and uh, the pastor he's uh, his wife now has these three little children, three little children, and their daddy is in prison for life, you know, three little children. Uh, and I mean, you know, very, very young, very, you know, so, uh, wow. Psalm 25 and verse number eight. <clears throat> So the fruit is goodness, good 
and upright is who? The Lord. All caps, L-O-R-D. Uh, that's, uh, that's Jehovah God. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The way is a reference to uh, God's way. God's way, the way. Uh, but what else? Psalm 34. If you would, Psalm 34. And uh, so, um, yeah. But see, when, when the wrong fruit, when the wrong fruit is on the branch, that's, that's, that's a red flag. And, and that's okay. I, I need to, I need to... <laughs> I need to uh, reconnect. There's there's a disconnect, um, and uh, and that's how serious it is. It, everything can change, lightning quick. I mean, just that fast. Wow. Anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, Psalm 34 and verse number eight. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is what is he? So, so um, when goodness is on display, when goodness is on display, that's, that's God. That's God on display. Uprightness, uprightness, goodness, uprightness. Uh, it's a reference to moral purity. Moral purity, holiness, godliness, goodness. And um, and then let's see what else. Uh, let's go to Romans chapter two. Let's let's look at a New Testament uh, reference of this particular uh, piece of fruit, which God is. This is what God is. And when this fruit is on display by our attitude, our actions, our words, our lifestyle, when this fruit is on display, it means God is on display and I you know I will assure you um, uh, that uh, th there will be a battle there will be spiritual warfare any anybody that has God on display uh, should understand should know and even anticipate uh, that it'll it'll be a battle yeah Oh, yes. Um, Romans 2 and verse number 4. Uh, or despisest thou the riches of his, of his what class? His goodness. He, his goodness because God is good. The Lord is good. Uh, despisest thou the, the riches of his goodness and Forbearance and uh, another fruit, um, long suffering. We looked at that. Um, we, we already talked about that. Uh, not knowing that the, not now look at this. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repent. Um, the goodness, the goodness of God, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. That's the goodness of God. When we were at our worst, Christ died for our sins. That's the goodness of God. Um, and so, let's look at Matthew chapter 19, another New Testament reference here to the goodness of God. So would you see that with me in, in Matthew chapter number 19? But uh, um, uh, I don't, you know, bring these things up to gossip about people. Um, I'm a... I'm still 
just, I think, uh, somewhat in shock. Um, and uh, I'm praying. I am praying. And asking God to help. Asking the Lord to help. Uh, now in Matthew chapter 19, and so we'll drop down to verse number 16. Um, again, uh, this fruit, this is... Uh, a, uh, really, it's a picture, a type of, of God, who, uh, what he is. All right. And uh, verse 16, Behold, one came and said unto him, and how does he reference Jesus? He calls him what? He calls him good master. And there's a reason he calls him good master. Uh, because as he's been listening to Jesus, as he's been observing Jesus as he's watched uh, the, the whole spirit countenance of Jesus, as he's been, you know, been a witness of, you know, to Jesus, he arrives at what conclusion about Jesus? Jesus is good. That's why he calls him good master. Uh, so, what does that mean? It means Jesus has this reputation uh, about him. He's good. He's pure. He's uh, holy. He's godly. He's sanctified. He's moral. I mean, and uh, this, this uh, is a, uh, uh, it's a young man. Another, another uh, parallel passage uh, tells us he's a rich, young ruler. We're not given that by Matthew, uh, but, uh, um, but just that, uh, you know, uh, well, maybe a little more detail later on here. What good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he's um, come to the realization that Jesus is good, but He comes to another conclusion about Jesus, and, and you know, he, so he's thinking, well, Jesus is going to heaven because Jesus is good, so I want to be good so I can get to heaven. And look what he, you know, he says, uh, you know, that's, that's his question, what good things shall I do? Well, Jesus has been doing, at this point, Jesus has done so many good things deeds and good works, otherwise miracles, raising the dead, healing. Um, and uh, so now this young man, you know, is supposing that because he's so good, that's why he's going to heaven and, and wants to know, well, what, what good things can I do to get to heaven? Um, now notice in verse number 17, and he, and he said unto him, why callest thou me good? Isn't that interesting? Now, now look at this. Verse 17, Jesus goes on to say to him, there is none good but one. And who is that class? That is God. I mean, so when you have goodness on display, biblical morality, purity, uprightness, holiness, godliness. When you're doing right by God, you've got Jesus on display. And, and make no mistake about it, you can expect a battle. See, the, the, the enemy doesn't mind the fruit of the flesh being on display. But um, have you ever heard this statement, uh, the enemy doesn't attack a church? Um, that is doing nothing for the cause of Christ, uh, that is not uh, preaching the gospel, that is not, um, you know, uh, abiding in Christ. Oh, no, he goes after the he goes after the ones, goes after the saints of God. That are, but uh, th but you know what? Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. So, my, how we need to draw 
nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. So um, there's none good but one, that is God. But, now to answer your question, he says, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. What an interesting answer. The young man, the, the, uh, he responds, verse 18, uh, or uh, he saith unto him, unto Jesus, which, which, there are hundreds, hundreds of commandments, which. And interestingly enough, Jesus quotes from uh, a partial list of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, I don't know if the young man interrupts Jesus. That is a partial list of the Ten Commandments. That is not all ten. But whatever the reason, uh, the young man interjects here in verse number 20. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth. My youth up, he says. But, but then this question, but then this question, what lack I yet? What lack I yet? He's, you know what's interesting? See, what's interesting to me is, what does the Bible say about every person? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. In fact, the Bible says there's not a righteous soul on earth. But here's, here's a, a young man who says to Jesus, um, all these... Um, What's he say? All these uh, things. He calls the commandment, he calls them things. He says, all these things have I kept from my youth up. But he asks this question, what lack I yet? Are you, are you getting this? He says, I've kept all these commandments. But in the next breath, he says, what lack I yet indicating what about this young man? What is that? That's a window into the soul of this young man. What does that let us know about this young man? Well, he says, what lack I yet? Now, now, what, what was his question what is it he wanted to know? Uh, go back to uh, verse 16. Uh, remember his question, what good thing shall I do that I may have what? That I may have eternal life so we know what's on his mind. He wants eternal life. So he says to Jesus, after hearing a partial list of the commandments, he says, now I've done, all, I've done all those commandments. I've obeyed those commandments. I've kept those commandments. But despite the fact he's kept those commandments, he's revealing something about himself by the question, what lack I yet? What does that tell us about eternal life and the Ten Commandments, or even a partial list of those Ten Commandments? What does that tell us about eternal life, the Ten Commandments? He says, I've kept those commandments. 
But what may we know about this young man by his question? He's lacking something. What lack I yet? <laughs> and that's what's driven him to Christ. That's why he has approached Jesus. I've kept the commandments, but I'm lacking something. What, what, what is there? What is there that's keeping me from having assurance? What lack I yet? Well, let's, let's look at the answer of Jesus to that next question from the young man. Verse, verse 21, he, Jesus saith unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, now if you go to the Greek language and you, you'll study out the word perfect, Interestingly enough, enough uh, one of the defining words for perfect is the word saved. Saved. If thou wilt be perfect, or, or even saved, look at Jesus says, Go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure. Where? In heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And come and follow me. What an amazing answer. Don't you find that an interesting answer? <laughs> if thou wilt be perfect or, or saved, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now let's see the response of the young man to that answer from Jesus, verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he did what, class? He, he, he went away from whom? From Jesus. He, he, look, he, he turned his back. Because if you're going to walk away from somebody, you have to turn your back on somebody to walk away from them. He, he really, he turned his back on Jesus. He walked away from Jesus. He went away. Not, not only did he go away, but what was his emotional state? Sad, sorrowful, sorrowful, full of sorrow. See, there's a lot going on here. Uh, and, you know, um, you heard me earlier say that he was, uh, he was rich. Well, the next statement, verse 22, for he had, what did he have? Verse 22, he had what? Great possessions. Great possessions. He was a rich man. He was a rich man. He was a ruler. But yet, he went away sorrowful. He had great possessions. So what do we learn from this passage that great possess possessions cannot give you? Great possessions did not give him, nor do great possessions give anybody today. What? Obviously, he's got great possessions, but what is his emotional condition? He's sorrowful. He's full of sorrow. But he has great possessions, but what else doesn't he have that compelled him to go to Jesus with a question? What else? Great possessions cannot give you happiness. He's got great possessions, but he's full of sorrow. Great possessions cannot give you what else? Cannot give you eternal life or salvation. Because if great possessions could give you Happiness and eternal life, he would have never gone to Jesus. What lack I yet? 
He has great possessions. Do you know what that means? It means he has everything that money can buy. He's got it all. And yet he has nothing that matters. He has absolutely nothing that matters. I mean, this is such an amazing passage from the Word of God. At least to me it is. Uh, so, he asked, what lack I yet? And we're going to see what he lacks. We're going to see what he lacks. He lacks the only thing that can save. He lacks the only thing that can save. And in love, in love, in fact, the uh, parallel passage uh, mentions that Jesus spoke to him out of love for him. This is all being done by God. Uh, from a heart full of love. The answer Jesus gave him in love, out of love, reveals what he lacks. Now, let's talk about it. What did Jesus tell him to do with all of his great possessions class? Sell them and do what with the proceeds from the sale? Give, give the proceeds to the poor and then do what? Come and follow me. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Right now, you know, he doesn't even have heaven. He's got everything on earth money can buy. And yet he has nothing of eternal worth and value. He's sorrowful. Um, he, has no, he has no assurance. He has no salvation. He, what is he lacking? Can you tell me, class, from the answer Jesus gave him or, or, or the instruction that Christ gave him, what Jesus told him to go and do, can you derive from that answer the one thing he's lacking and it's the only thing that can save his soul? Anybody? What, 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 what is he struggling with? What is, what is the young, rich man young, what is he struggling with? Now look, uh, when, verse 22, stay with me. When the young man heard that saying, you know, um, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He didn't want to sell the great possessions. Would you please tell me why he did not want to let go of those great possessions? Huh? Well, they, they did matter. They mattered more to him. They mattered more to him than anything else, but tell me why they ma Why did those great possessions matter more to him? Sorry? Oh, you're close. You're just all around it. Why do people struggle letting go of possessions or giving possessions? In this case, it's to the poor, but, but what is the great struggle that people have releasing possessions? Where is this young man's trust vested? Upon what is the young man's trust vested? based upon riches. What he lacks, where, 
where is the young man vested his faith? Where is the young man vested his trust? In possessions. Not just but great possessions. He's rich. He's very rich. If he lets go of those great possessions, if he does what Jesus... Boy, this is in love from Jesus. You know what Jesus is, is desiring to accomplish in the young man's heart and life? He wants this young man to get saved from hell. He loves this young man, and he wants this young man to be saved. But in order for that to happen, the young man must do one thing, which is absolutely essential to salvation. The young man must shift his trust from what to whom? From his money. To Jesus Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I know a lot of people really have a hard time with this passage, and it's like, well, yes, so you're saying that God wants me to go, you know, sell all my possessions, give it all to the poor? Uh, no, that's not what I'm saying, and that's really not, and that's not what God is saying. It is what God is saying to this particular rich young man. Because this may not be your situation, but this is the situation of one particular rich young man who walked the earth 2,000 years ago. He had put his faith in his possessions. In order for him to be saved, he's he, he's got to put his faith in Jesus Christ. The reason he walks away sorrowful, he's unwilling to do that. He's going, he's made the decision, I'm going to keep trusting my money, possessions, things, stuff, whatever you want to label it. Verse 23, please. And uh, then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man, when Jesus just calls it what it is, he says that a rich man shall hardly Enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, what, why, is it, why is it very, very hard for a rich man to, to go to heaven? What makes it hard for a rich man to go to heaven? It's the same reason. Uh, people who have come to trust in their riches they have a very difficult time moving their trust from money from riches to Jesus Christ okay. we'll hold that thought don't let it slip away um and then Jesus goes on to say, verse 24, And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now think about that. You ever try to thread a needle? Any of you ever try to thread a needle? <laughs> That's how I know when I need new glasses. When I try to thread a needle, I can't get it done. I'm saying, I'm taking this thing to Cecil. I'm going to have him thread this needle for me. <laughs> Amen. I'll make the sandwiches while you thread the needle. Amen. 
I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the of a uh, the eye of a needle than for a rich man to do what? To enter into the kingdom of God, because there's only one way into the kingdom of God. That's that's salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. There it is. Wow. Well, verse 25, when the, his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter, now look at this, you got to see this, and I, we'll be done here momentarily. But verse 27, then Peter answered and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? You know what he's saying? He is telling Jesus, we gave all of it up. We walked away from it all to follow you. They just saw the rich young man walk away from Jesus to cling to his riches, his possessions. When they saw that rich young man hold on to his possessions, it got them thinking. He... He's still got all of his stuff. Now, what are we going to have? We walked away from everything. What are we going to have? That's what, that's what he's saying to Jesus. And Jesus, verse 28, said unto them, Verily, I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration of uh, I believe this to be a reference to the kingdom of Christ uh, here upon the earth. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, he also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now that is to the twelve, uh, the, uh, twelve apostles. But now for all the rest of us, look at verse 29. This is all inclusive for you who believe, who have received Christ as Savior. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, you know, and that's, that is significant. Do, do you know um, a lot of parents and grandparents uh, I don't know if you're aware of this. They never want their, they they always want their uh, children and their grandchildren to stay in the immediate vicinity of where they live. Are you aware of that? Did you know that? They want their family to be very very close, and they want the family to get together and spend time together, and you know do things together and go places together. You know, and they and um, some of them even discourage their children, and grandchildren, from answering God's call. And they do. Oh yes, they do, because they don't want their children to be. When the you see, when the children have the grandchildren, they want the grandchildren, they want the grandchildren close by, so they can have that time with you know. See. So this is significant. When you answer God's call and his call takes you away from your family, that means something to God. God understands that you have, you have put him before all others. And that, that, that is significant to God. That means something to God. Uh, and, uh, you know... Um, And, uh, but look, he says, if you'll leave your father, mother, wife, children, lands for my name's sake, here's his promise. You'll receive an hundredfold 
and shall inherit everlasting life. God says, if you'll put me first, God says, I'll bless you a hundredfold. And of course, uh, everlasting life. Everlasting life because you have put your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ. And finally, but many that are first, in the Greek, the word first, uh, it means selfish, shall be last. And the, the word last in the Greek, it means lowest in rank. So, well, now, so the people in this life that have put themselves first ahead of God, God says uh, they'll, they'll be uh, lowest in rank. And the last shall be first. Uh, and that means highest in rank. Um, God's going to turn everything around in his kingdom. He's going to turn everything around. Uh, everything is skewed. Everything is perverted. Uh, good is bad. Right is wrong in the world presently. But God's going to make it all right as it should be in his kingdom and eternity forever. Um, in the world system, those who keep, uh, who keep the most rule, right? Right, in this system right now, whoever has the most rules. In God's system, those who give away rule are the rulers. Wow. Uh, God says, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. God just has a just entirely different way of, of doing what he does. Um, wow. God is good. The fruit of the Spirit, goodness. That is what God is. And when that's on your branch, as a child of God, you're literally showing people, um, you're giving them a picture of God. Goodness, that's a picture of God. Um, as we go to prayer, uh, it is so easy to push the override button. What do you mean by that? You keep saying that. What do you mean the override button? It's so easy to shove the spirit out of the way and for the flesh to take over. It, it can happen so quickly. May God help us to walk in the Spirit. Because if we don't walk in the Spirit, we will fulfill the lusts of the flesh.